I'm a cognitive um, lecturer of cognitive science, and I come from the University of Helsinki, Finland. And um, my work has been done in the um, cognitive brain research unit in the University of Helsinki, and also um, by my laboratory, also situated in Helsinki. So I'm going to talk about um, morphological processing in the brain and I present first some approaches that have been done uh, in that field and then I'll also present some of our work um, on electrophysiological processing of inflected and derived words and I will also um, focus on the speech um, spoken words and also I present briefly the effect of attention on morphological processing and also a bit of automatic activation of um, morphological representations. So this is our outline of my book. So first of all a bit of motivation because uh, as Alec Maran said once uh, when morphologists speak to syntacticians now so why would anyone be interested in morphological complexity? As you can see, uh, and by the way, my work will be about Finnish because I come from them. And um, as you are well aware, morphology investigates the internal structure of words, which are assumed to be the basic uh, building blocks of language. However, in Finnish, um, Morphology is particularly rich, so all the grammatical <coughs> relations are conveyed by uh, suffixes mostly. So, uh, as you can see from the figure on the right, each Finnish noun can have uh, clitics excluded about 140 uh, different inflectional forms, and each verb can have uh, more than 200 different forms. And when clitics are included, then the numbering is uh, something about 2,000 different words for a noun and 10,000 for verbs. And also, um, it's been um, also found that uh, new complex words appear to languages all the time, and um, even new suffixes appear. As, uh, as you can see, I found some examples yesterday from um, internet there there's a new word called bikini which combines burka and bikini which means uh, a very covering swimming suit for muslim women which covers mostly everything but it's called bikini which is very convenient so uh, i'm not sure whether it's an affix or a new compound um, and also there's a new word which i, I wasn't aware of is chillaxing so you can chill and um, relaxing so sort of the same thing something so you can say I'm chillaxing now. This is a new word for me. And also uh, there is this new suffix which gates which is uh, I think it's from Watergate originally which is something uh, you know from the 70s which is uh, gate I think it's relates to some sort of scandal. There has been um, a scandal, a political scandal, a scandal with the mental mm -hmm. human and so the people have been saying that it's he must be. So, so you see there words coming up. And this Benaki um, is the new word which my um, PhD student came up with. So it's like it's a known word but we could all understood and give it the meaning like uh, key there's a I think it's diminutive, can they say so? Somebody who, who is burnt or something like this. So it's now being used in our group all the time. So that's how I became interested in, in morphology. And also because I found that for our foreigners that, who come to Finland, uh, morphology, or it's hard for them to learn. Finished because the amount of suffixes is something like 14 and it's very, um, very complex. So they also always complain that it's hard to learn Finnish. So, and it was hard for me also when I was a teenager, but it's not hard anymore. So, what happens when we hear um, 
words like salmalla or salmasta? Is there some kind of um, mechanism in the brain? So. And I also will focus on duration uh, and inflection, a uh, common distinction with within morphology. Probably this is uh, also very basic for you, but I just wanted to say there's a major distinction, a major debate also uh, theoretically uh, that reflection and derivation, they, they also, uh, both of them have affixes um, which carry semantic and syntactic information that you see here, directional affixes for new words. So catless is some, someone without a cat, so pradas is for plumrat and ost, which is um, um, an affix which forms nouns. And uh, whereas inflection affixes, they specify grammatical relations. Um, so like uh, cats is uh, plural. So they both, um, the mechanism is the same. So when you have cat, you add something but yet they have different functions. So um, people have been interested in, in these forms and one of the major questions has been the nature of lexical representation. How these complex words derived and inflected and also com composed, uh, how they are processed in the brain and um, in, in general, of course, and how words with several meanings uh, are represented in the process. So this has been done for, um, I think, since 75 or something. There's been vigorous debate which goes on and on, it becomes more, more and more complex. So, um, within research and morphological processing, they have asked, are these morphological complex words represented as, as whole units, as you know, the, the whole uh, corpus or like a mental lexicon would contain snowflakes and stains and happening and darkness and smoke, snow mess, everything is stored and then um, you just recall from memory and, and then you say that. Or are these um, complex words broken down and decomposed into more things while you listen or read them and produce them? And, uh, or are they both ways possible as hybrid models uh, suggest? And then some kind of factors affect the, the way they're processed and represented. And for instance, um, factors such as frequency would affect them and the morphological transparency and the how frequent is the affix is supposed to, um, also suggested to, to affect. So there are, has been a full form model, uh, also full decomposition model early on, and also then hybrid models. Yeah, so um, they postulate um, either storage than obligatory decomposition. And as I said, the chosen groups depends on all uh, word properties. And the newer model postulates different representation at different stages of processing. So there would be some kind of a blind uh, mortal orthographic decomposition to words, and thereafter they're semantically integrated. Yes, and then, um, and most of the models are behavioral, so they do not predict any, any whatsoever uh, neural processing, except some more recent models, such as uh, core morphological decomposition model. And also some of the models, for instance, in Finnish, you all know this side model, which uh, is based on neuropsychological data, in, and uh, they have been found some differences between inflected and derived words. So they also predict <laughs> distinctions. But this, um, this model which uh, makes predictions on neural processing in the brain also um, differentiates between inflections and derivations. So they say, based on uh, patient and fMRI data, 
they say that um, rule-based inflections are largely processed by the left frontotemporal network, whereas um, for the right words, a bilateral system is activated because the meaning of the right words is less um, predictable. For instance, Kahvila um, game is nowadays something more than a place where you can have coffee, it's a coffee shop, or there are some, or some other examples which you can find with derivations which are more than just a uh, sum of um, suffix and the, and the base. They are sort of uh, lexicalized already. So that's why they predict that, uh, that also uh, the bilateral um, frontotemporal network is activated for this one. So they do, um, process differently than uh, inflections. So that's what we're going to talk about more. That's how I became interested, interested in this. And because I will concentrate on Finnish, I will just briefly say what has been found behaviorally also. As I described, they, there's huge different um, variations of inflections for each noun. And um, when participants have read um, inflected words, they show a robust morphological processing cost, which is they uh, elicit more errors and uh, longer reaction times as compared to matched um, monomorphic words. Whereas derived words do not typically show such cost. So um, they have postulated that morphological decomposition will occur only for inflections in Finnish, which may stem from the fact that um, derived affixes also have um, a lot of allomorphs and they also appear in the, in the language as inflected mostly, so it has been thought by, I think, proposed by Van Nesterpal and also by um, Jarvi Kivethon that um, it is more sort of um, economical to just um, destroy them and just to treat them, but um, there's still a debate and some um, some studies have found that uh, when then when you control allomorphs in affixes, such as um, affix sto does not change even except when you have sto sto, but but when it's inflected, there's no um, any kind of allomorphic variance. So they they then show the composition, but when you have other affixes, they change their phonological form when they inflect it. So this affects the composition and hinders it. So that's the basic theoretical uh, idea behind this, which I really started to test. And um, within electrophysiological studies in other languages, it has been done in, um, in basic um, uh, violation paradigms. So they roughly they have found that regularly inflected words such as jump have mostly elicited the left anterior negativity effect, which you all know what it is, so I didn't explain this in turn. Whereas um, the processing of irregular inflected words such as REM has elicited the M100, which was suggested to reflect lexical semantic access of the whole form. And it should be noted that uh, studies of correctly inflected Finnish words have also elicited the larger and for hybrid effect to, um, to inflected words as compared to monomorphic words, which have been suggested to, um, to reflect combinatorial processing. And sometimes um, the reviewers also have been asking, so how it is possible if you have N400 and the others have found N400 and they have said that uh, it reflects storage, so what is this? Interesting, we'll come back to that later. But it's usually been suggested that it reflects the later phases of processing, sort of a lexical semantic combination of the morphemes. 
and the earlier effect, uh, which Yuri also talked about, we haven't or they haven't seen it at all. Um, so more geographic decomposition is not seen usually at the early stages in here, please. And whereas it's sort of clear within inflections, but the process energy rightwards in ERPs and MEG studies has elicited uh, all sort of effects, N400 and LAN, and uh, they have been interpreted uh, as reflecting uh, the composition mostly, but, but not, I mean, they haven't summarized it. But what does it really mean? So there's a lot of work needs to be done yet on the right word processing. So it's very inconsistent. And within fMRIs, they have shown also some some of the stuff on them activated on the uh, left side. Some have found also on the right side. So they're really inconsistent, mostly because um, probably of the paradigms and also because So there's still, um, within morphological processing, there's still stress electrophysiological studies investigating uh, directly comparison of the right and infected words. Um, there are also no studies in effect of sensory modality in context of processing, which I uh, would nicely show that um, some effects are really modal. And uh, as I just said, there's a uh, results on the right word processing and uh, most of the models and most of the studies within uh, morphological processing have been conducted on visual, with visual presentation and uh, so there's sort of no model of, or hardly any studies with spoken words and also um, um, visual studies say that there's um, sort of automatic decomposition early on going on based on uh, mask priming results. But uh, there are no studies on how this effect of attention um, is taking place from spoken copious words. And also um, basically no element studies on infected in the right words except except for some that you will present, but they haven't been done in within one study. You will tell you more what has been done with, with all kinds of stuff. Okay, so I will start presenting some of the studies that have been done within our lab. And first I will focus on uh, whether inflected pro processing is a model as um, some of the theoretical um, ideas on finish has been presented that um, there would be sort of uh, modality specific um, early decomposition and a later lexical semantic um, integration of the morphemes should be able to according roughly to Simon. So we decided to test that. Uh, funny there's a visual presentation which was moved. Anyways. This was a lexical decision task, which you had to press a word, whether the word was word or non-word. And there were two experiments, visual experiment and auditory presentation with the same stimuli. And the there were four conditions, one morphemic word, which is, uh, here it says Morton, which is right, and inflected words, uh, which is something like cats, or here, most of, of a cheese. And then we had one more pink pseudo words and inflected pseudo words. So we wanted to see whether um, this automatic decomposition would take place also for um, pseudo words, so whether this um, lexical effects of the stimulus affects uh, processing. And we recorded EG here. And, and Here you see FR100, so this is the old study of my PhD work, and you can see I started as a standard in 
researcher and then, then I moved to the deviant. Um, anyways, uh, so you can uh, see here that within a uh, visual or auditory modality, um, there was no um, so both show more errors and longer reaction times to infected than one more pink words in, in both modalities. So this is like a replication of uh, many, many uh, visual studies with different paradigms in Finnish. So there's something going on, definitely behaviorally also. Um, the words are most probably parsed into the affixes and thereafter combined to form a lexical representation. And then what we saw here in ERPs, as CZ, we can see that um, there was a lot larger negativity for inflected than morphemic words, also in both modalities, and um, which is far more pronounced in visual ERPs, which can be uh, due to also as a form of presentation. Uh, Auditory stimulus unfolds in time, whereas uh, the visual stimulus just pops out immediately. And we saw that this effect is only present for um, real words. So, sort of, if, when you see this um, green line inflected to the words, they elicit the most, uh, the biggest uh, hunger. But when you compare them to monomorphic pseudo words, you don't, don't see any kind of um, statistical significant differences between them. So, which means that um, morphological decomposition takes place only for real words. So, what we saw basically is there was a similar type effect, but um, the visual modality took place much longer due to the um, the form of presentation of polio, but on the central, um, obviously central um, lexical semantic processing, uh, the morphological decomposition is a model, and the real words then is required to initiate morphological decomposition. Um, but um, what I found curious later on, and I started thinking that. Um, Okay, we have the central hunger effect that many others have done also, and um, it is really nice that something going on, but as my colleague pointed out, uh, you sort of start to look in at your uh, stimuli from the beginning of the word, and you, you get the really like um, sort of late response, as you can see the, the effects found significant effects were found on the uh, plates. So I started thinking that when you have, here we have 100 inflected words. So I started thinking that uh, we don't know exactly when the morphological, uh, like, uh, exactly composition takes place, or whether this is something um, overall yeah, or hidden between. So uh, I read a lot of uh, this much negative work presented before. We started thinking, what, what can we do? Can we somehow zoom in to to um, to the affixes and see what happens after that instead of the um, beginning of the word? And then um, at the approximately the same time, I read this paper um, by Maria and Longton in the Journal of. Um, Maryland language, a very nice paper. They observed evidence for early semantically blind decomposition and later semantic integration with uh, written derived words, or actually they uh, did the cross model priming here. And they suggested that for derived words there would be some kind of um, two stage processing. And then I look at the papers and uh, I realize that okay, there are no papers on spoken words, so have there, can we do something? And we did. So um, we we designed a study, a lexical decision, uh, not priming, because I thought it would be really, really nice to tap on the real processing. And then we presented the derived words and pseudo words auditorily, and we had three conditions following um, Monet and Monte. 
So we have existing the right words, such as um, melatonin, and always had the same suffix. And paddling, and then we had um, formed legal, sort of legal derives of the words. So they will combine for exist, existing um, stem and then existing suffix, but their um, their combination was not found uh, in the corpus, and also with the proof question that we did. So they were not existent but understandable according to our participants who were not included here. And then we also constructed the legal type of the words following the previous studies. And, and they should um, they should elicit also some um, some perhaps um, and for hundred or as such because they are not semantically um, Congruent also and do it derivationally. And also, we talk about blocked our stimuli now to the onset of the stimulus and also to onset of the suffix and precise onset also. So, what we found was um, when we talk about our stimuli to the onset of the stimulus, we found uh, an increased L100 to, to a legal derived words. There were no differences between um, existing derived words and those uh, legal, meaningful derived pseudo words. Um, but these effects were not significant. So I was a little bit um, crushed by that. But when we started to analyze some examples of time work ERPs, we found this really nice response. So as you can see from the figure E, um, there were also, again, no differences in the MP responses between existing um, derived words and legal derived pseudo words. But um, illegal derived words elicited a larger negativity, which was um, because we all, always had the same, same um, suffix, so we could nicely uh, see follow what's going on here. And um, so approximately 100 milliseconds after the deviation point and complex uniqueness point here, uh, there is an uh, increase in the responses, which was significant. So I'm not sure whether it's at 100 like negativity, but or early negativity. But there was a response. But interestingly enough, there was still kind of, kind of successful decomposition for legal derived pseudo words, here should be. And even though both types of pseudo words were not familiar to the participants, still the other ones were um, processed and the other ones were not. There was this sort of uh, what's going on here, sort of. So that probably there's some uh, failed. Um, licensing or integration of the morphine combination as followed by this familiar lockdown. So semantics. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. And what do you mean by the other one was processed? Uh, are you so do you mean the composition? Yeah, yeah. Parsing. Yeah, I think. So then parsed was which one? Uh, legal. Legal, pseudo, yeah. Then the legal pseudo so you was not. No, I think it. And what about uh, non pseudo words, but actually real words? They are parts as well. Yeah, I think that, but we didn't have a monomorphic condition, but I think because uh, they should be also parts, but. Why? Mm, because they were really, um, they were really low frequent, but we can, of, of course, not, cannot test them. Because I'm a little bit uh, skeptic mm -hmm. about design. If uh, subjects uh, so uh, all this combination of illegal pseudos, legal pseudos, but still pseudos, they were kind of trying to see some uh, morphological derivational affixes. And uh, in real life, we don't, uh, our task is not to distinguish between real words and pseudos, so we are not trying to to see this uh, morphological openness. Uh, so I, I guess it can be a little bit of uh, laboratory effect. They were trying, already trying to distinguish. Oh, you mean, yeah. 
Because of Mexico decision. Yes, because for me, Melanta is good enough to be not ours. It's Melanta, it's just one Mexico entry without seeing a derivational service for, for in real life. It should be tested, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But in this combination with pseudo words, legal, illegal pseudo words, we are still primed to see something. Something strange to, to, to distinguish, to see. Even though with uh, a lot of fillers. Yeah, um, even we had a lot of like. Yes, uh, yes but still. Yeah. But I think this is the. If I see Erdogan tap and then Melon tap, of course I am primed to see something. You don't tap. see you here. Oh, okay, if I hear. And they were matched until they were matched uh, until uh, sort of with their uh, deviation point and competency mixes point. So you sort of uh, didn't, could not predict whether they are um, words or non-words. Yeah. So maybe I'm wrong in, the, in yeah, this my comment, true. but still yeah, it's I understand kind of what you mean. But of course, um, this is just um, you know, the beginning of yeah. planning. And also so. you, you have to take into account uh, when further studying this, whether um, the suffix is um, allomorphic invariant or allomorphic invariant and the hard um, like difficulty with this uh, you have to perhaps maybe manipulate derivations but here we didn't have monomorphic words which is but later we do which I, I'll come back to this yeah but here maybe it's stress significance of time walking the piece that's original to the onset of the and here is another study which, where we continued uh, investigated spoken derived words and also inflected words, but, but we did not uh, analyze here the pseudo words, but only the real words. And here we had another study, which, okay, you, can, you were primed here too, by judging whether they were acceptable in Finnish or not acceptable. Uh, what about words? Um, we can have the same surface form both derived and invented. Uh, say, Boiton is mm -hmm. without water and uh, victory generally. So, is that the. Uh, do you mean are they decomposed to? Well, they are double decomposition, which uh, means inter was... interventional and inflectional. Uh, I think they did a study in 2002 by uh, Yaroki where they uh, manipulated Skukan and, um, and Thalon or something and they didn't find any uh, differences so uh, they also decomposed I think so uh, and finished the album of the stem that's not the fact the composition I think if, is that what you asked? I think the acoustic is not the same though yeah but it was a we visual study yeah. 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 yeah yeah everything was uh, previously done visually so there's a lot Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was—I think it was either private or Mexico decisions to be unusual. But there, they didn't find any differences in election times between this problem. I mean that if you that mm -hmm. your words are oh. processed differently, uh, then there are these words that uh, that make an error. You might know which paradigm to follow. I think there is, there is evidence that if you see an inflection like this, you're likely to decompose it uh, automatically. Mm -hmm. it's not, we don't know whether it's triple duration. So it could be that so you, try, you try to pause even though it doesn't make sense. It, 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 you know, sort of stable English example is corn, which is point, which is which seems to be still part of into core plus ER as perfection methods. So it could be the same thing goes maybe in the Voigton case, uh, in Greek case at least, and then one of them wins in the end. So both both has have to be done and then one wins. Okay, I have to make some comments. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here we uh, did a different task, but and we had a monomorphic um, words here, and there was potent and inflected words and derived words. See some uh, 
work less and um, something like our other cheese and uh, bride. And then we recorded both EEG and MEG here and channeled them to the stimulus and to, um, to the critical point just to compare what happens when we zoom in. And then um, behaviorally, even though the task was different and not used previously, and they were all correct words, um, reflective words elicited more errors than derived and morphemic words, which replicates the earlier uh, visual lexical decision studies. And then um, overall, reflective words elicited larger effect than morphemic and derived words. And when we see uh, compare stimulus onset time of PRPs and critical point time of PRPs, critical point meant, meant here that we, um, because it was impossible to match uh, monomorphemic words, um, there was no suffix, but we tried our best to do some kind of, it, it, we had overall of 900 stimuli, so it was impossible to do gating test, but it was based on this for the search. But we, did them on a uniqueness point or a recognition point to the monomorphic words and to the onset of the suffix for the right word. So that was the first option they came to mind. I open the suggestion for it, uh, making this better. But what we see here is um, some sort of left uh, lateralized um, N500 type of. Um, negativity and stimulus onset time point, um, time lock therapies, whereas when we time lock them to critical point, we see the shift on, of um, lateralization is more, it reminds more of the left anterior negativity or left or left temporal something. It wasn't, wasn't as clear which is more, but um, it's definitely Quite early, it was something about 200 milliseconds after the onset of the critical point. Whereas when you look at the stimulus onset time lock, it's something about six, 600 milliseconds. So it, it was not seen, or it gets overlaid by the 100. Um, can I ask okay. just a small technical question? What is a time lock? Uh, onset time lock therapies. Oh, uh, so, sorry if uh, you time lock the, um, your earpiece to the onset of the of steam. Of steam. But why should we use this time lock? Is there any other options for the earpiece? That's what I mean. I have, she, uh, has, uh, has here two, two, two ways of time locking. You have to start counting somewhere. Ah, okay. So the easiest case is to start counting and what else? Yeah, it's because yeah, this is what everyone does. And measure and measure all this kind of the visual yeah. it's all right. Yes. You know, the visual it gets really hairy because okay. the point when people like I make an example of crocodile, the point when what they're triggered on is uh, varying a lot. So that's a good example of what happened, how we can improve data by time looking to the relevant. Yeah. So there's a more methodological uh, Yeah, because uh, there is not so many stimuli on spoken words, so this I found this is very crucial by what we saw from your talk. And so we see here the early effect, which is not found normally. And here is where the sources of these effects come from. And um, first we did the minimum current estimate without any a priori assumption on where the effects come from, and then we found um, differences between inflected and the right words such that and for inflected words there is a bigger activation and which is nicely left lateralized but there was not enough for a referees who wanted to us to do some further work and then we um, analyzed dipole models to see whether this big uh, block for inflected words is composed for something more than just one source and then we found um, sort of source factor one, which is, you can see there, which is um, sort of common to all stimuli, and then something um, small and pattern, which you can see that's all over the place for monomorphic and derived words, which can be said that um, it's hard to, um, to 
sort of um, see that, that clear effect. But for inflected words, it's much more systematic. So there, for other types of stimuli, there's no uh, source pattern to or it's very diminished. Whereas for inflected, there's something there is we want to believe. And also, we noticed some early effects for such a part of one. There's something going on which is larger for derived than one morphemic words. Whereas in sort of pattern two, there on the left hemisphere, you see the bigger activation for inflected words. Uh, whereas uh, basically no activation for uh, derived and one or being. So there's clear differences between them. So what we wanted to, how we wanted to interpret is that uh, there's large and net naturalized responses for spoken inflected words which um, reflect combinatorial processing. Whereas um, we see also two overlapping, overlapping neural sources, a common source which perhaps a cohort-like um, mapping of phonological information under semantic representations of the words. And then uh, there's another source which is all, all, only systematic in inflected word condition, which perhaps reflects processes specific to inflection, such as um, decomposition, and which led us to believe that there might be a dual processing of spoken derived words, perhaps, because we saw this early activation, which is larger for derived words. And perhaps uh, when you process derived words online, auditorily, they activate uh, some kind of um, representation for um, affix and their homomorphs and also um, the full, full form. But this is very tentative. Um, and I'm not sure if I want to present this one. This is the old one. Perhaps skip it. Uh, something like we did also a um, um, sentence study where we compared um, infected and derived words and sentences, and we also saw uh, differences between them, left internal negativity and 100, and also uh, P600 later effects. And when we um, sort of made a, did an additivity analysis, we saw that uh, at the very late stages of processing, they're still um, independent, so they're sort of, um, even then, when they combine inflected and right words in one word, they do not interact on the neural level. So we have uh, both visual and auditory evidence for a different processing. Yeah, yeah. And this I wanted to briefly um, go on with um, how the spoken and affected the right word are processed when the attention is taken away from the stimuli. So this is a continuation of the study where, where I just told you where they were presented on auditory and they had to press the button here. They had to uh, just listen, passively listen or not pay attention to the stimuli and concentrate on the cartoon and they had to uh, ask some, or like they were asked to fill in the questionnaire and most of them did really fine so they really concentrated on stimuli. And uh, we had the same type of stimuli but not the same. So altogether we had really a lot of words to, to different experiments. So what happens when they listen to the stimuli? Um, there is um, early, as you can see here attended, there's some early activation again for the right words. And some early activation in also in non-attended task. So you can see that really something about 100 milliseconds after the onset of the critical information, there's no effect of attention. Whereas, as you can see, about 200 milliseconds after the critical point, the bigger red curve for inflected words, which is probably um, their parsing, it disappears. So um, the effects are only present in that 
attending the class, which I find very interesting because somehow you know, I think it goes nicely with what you were getting. But, um, and here also where the AEG effects come from, and they are most prominent in the temporal areas of the cortex. And source activity is smaller when that tension is shifted than other tasks, which is, of course, maybe because we had a really a lot of um, stimuli and uh, we could not match them as um, acoustically, as perfectly as, as in your studies, as was done before. And here you see some activation still, also for a non attendant stimuli. Um, for inflected and derived words, and less so for morphemic words, which can be, um, there may be some activation, but not so well, not so well for parsing perhaps for them. And MEG data shows again that early source activity is not affected by attention, which is again um, is bigger for derived words, which perhaps, um, as I explained, there may be um, some kind of durable processing or. Um, double activation of affix representation and full form, which um, just continues longer than for non-morphemic words. And as you can see later, source effects disappear where attention is shifted to another task. So the EG results really nicely complement the EG data. So um, we can conclude that um, early activation was elicited by both attended and non-attended conditions and uh, the early stage may reflect some kind of automatic mapping of incoming acoustic information and activation might take longer for derived words and um, later differences between word types were not found here when the attention was taken away so there might be a later compositional processes uh, when are just either hidden in this this kind of setup or you know, just just do not take place. I'm not sure about this. Yeah, but I think these findings are interesting. And just um, this is my last study so we probably tired. Um, and here is also a study done in collaboration with Turing. And you see in here, we wanted to see also the automatic processing of flexion and derivation, but also their storage because um, with MOM we can nicely um, sort of extract the, the activation, automatic activation of memory traces for words and affixes. So we really can tap on the representation of the, the words. And these words were really rigorously matched. They both of the inflected and derived words have had the same suffix acoustically, but in, um, for the derived words it marked adjective uh, some some of the same spelling. And with um, inflected words it was a plural marker. And we also had matched um, certain words with um, certain words stem and uh, with suffix. Um, and we used passive on all paradigms, so there were standards and occasional um, deviants. So, like we had uh, standards as the stems and the deviants were inflected words and we concentrated on. And uh, what we see here, is what I see here, and we also uh, we analyzed our effects in two time windows based on the ICA. Um, um, how do you say ICA? Yeah, the directly components. I say components. Yeah. So we did a really um, good work in just uh, to make sure that uh, there we can analyze the double peak, at least with this problem. And then we 
can, we can see here that uh, in the earlier time window, we were already uh, able to find differences between the inflected and the right words. And uh, in the later time window, we also saw not only the effects of uh, morphology and differences between the inflected and the right, but also the effect of frequency. So, uh, more frequent stimuli and especially um, high frequency derived words elicited larger effects than low frequency derived words, which shows a lot of really normal findings. So, you may say that um, there is a lexical representation for Valle, which is stronger than um, for Costa, for instance. Although, uh, based on some other theoretical models, you they suggest, and you can also expect from my earlier findings, that all derived words are um, sort of um, stored, but there's something wrong with them, you can see here. And we also um, compared inflected words and inflected pseudo words, and so the sort of uh, publication of the syntactic MMN effect that uh, for inflected pseudo word they elicited larger MMN, whereas uh, for derived words um, they elicited larger, larger MMN than, um, than derived pseudo words, which is uh, sort of uh, goes nicely with lexical MMN hypothesis. So even though we saw some differences between them, the derived words clearly still um, different, are differentiated from inflected words. And as you know, this is a highly automatic process. We do not pay any kind of attention to them. And the sources of this activity come from um, left temporal areas, and this is EG, this is from EG, but we Nicely, nicely obtain them, and uh, the sources are left lateralized, and we can see a nice frequency effect here within sources too, and then also the morphology effect is, is replicated in, in source activity also. So, what we conclude here as at approximately 100 milliseconds after a suffix onset. Um, derived words that is a large MMN amplitude than inflected words. And um, so activation of memory traces for derivation um, are stronger than, than for inflection, inflected words. And uh, which perhaps are also always decomposed, whereas the picture is not as clear in derived words. And um, still for derived words there, there might be strong word specific long term memory sequence. And um, so we conclude that there's inflected um, words may not form strong full form of memory traces. And there is at least partially distributed brain mechanism for the representation and also process. Duration. So to generally conclude our representation processing of inflection and derivation in Finnish is a difference. So for inflected words we always see, and also previous studies um, have seen, also manipulating frequency for inflected words. They have seen only decompositional processing. For derived words, they might initiate both full form decompositional processing or reflecting, uh, depending on frequency of the word also. And um, similar type of morphological processing in both visual and auditory modalities. And uh, no effect of attention in the earliest phases of uh, post-suffix processing, whereas later stages may be subject. And I would like to thank our Brain Records team at CPR University of Helsinki, especially me here. And also uh, by Magda, which kindly always lets me in and lets me to do whatever I want. And also Yuri in Cambridge and also Harold in Poland.
hot stone cream lab. And you can see here our nice TMS device in, uh, in our TMS lab. Okay. Thank you.